I've hit record. So welcome to the show, folks. Thank you very much for joining me, Eric Weaver, Sea Smoke Pipes. Well, well thanks for having me, Kaz. <laughs> Uh, we've been having some technical issues, folks, so this is the third time, and hopefully it's third time lucky. Um, <laughs> I'll ask you again, hopefully it's not monotonous. What are you smoking, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> well, right now I'm having my afternoon smoke, which is normally a kind of a medium English blend. It's uh, Peter Heinrich's blend number 39. I just uh, picked this up about a month ago, and I'm loving it. Have you gotten through it rightly then? Was it a two ounce tin or? Yeah, it's a, a hundred gram tin. Um, I'm, I'm probably about halfway through it. Nice. Um, right. Well, what I wanted to ask you, um, where did the name come from? Sea Smoke Pipes? Are you? <laughs> um, well, it's, I live uh, in Northern Wisconsin um, up by Lake Superior. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if the temperatures are just right and, uh, if the wa if the water is warm, I think it's, if the water is warmer than, uh, the air above it, mm -hmm. you'll get kind of this big wall of fog Nice that people call sea smoke. Right. Right. So you'll see that every now and again on the lake. And it's, it's a pretty cool, cool looking thing. That's cool. And uh, I always just thought that it, that the name for that was just cool, sea smoke. And then um, uh, a few years ago, I was thinking about, you know, giving the, the business an actual name instead of just, um, you know, Eric Weaver Pipes, which is good, too. Who knows? I might change back to that someday. But, um, yeah, so I just decided to see smoke pipes. Pipes and pottery sounded good. Certainly does. It reminds me of the story of the song Smoke on the Water, uh, yeah. the Deep Purple song. Wasn't it the mm -hmm. hotel they were staying in burned down or, or they were playing in a hotel and it burned down? And the, I don't know the story, but I know the song. I think that's that's they were playing and the venue burned down. It was a hotel. Then they were st sitting by a lake that was beside it and there was smoke, you know, slowly billowing down on the, the surface of the water. That's my rendition of the story anyway. I'm sure it's not yeah. correct. But I think my dad told me that story about a hundred times, so I think it's right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting. Um how long have you been making pipes for then? Or what what came um, first? Was it was it pipes or pottery that came first? Uh pipes actually I guess came first. I I did do ceramics in high school, but not any pottery. It was all more um, sculptural, hand built stuff. Mm -hmm. And then um, around the end of two thousand and three, I was living in the um, Twin Cities, St. Paul, Minneapolis, Minnesota area. I lived there for about a year. Mm -hmm. And my girlfriend at the time, now she's my wife, picked me up one of those um, pre-drilled blocks, mm -hmm. you know, the kits, because I was talking about wanting to try that because I was already smoking a pipe and stuff. And um, I had seen one of those in a pipe shop. And so she picked it up for me and just started whittling away. And so I've been uh, making pipes on some level ever since then. Mm -hmm. But um, it's been a real slow progression as far as, you know, getting any money to buy any real tools and materials and working other jobs and starting a family, buying a house, paying the bills. So, and then um, I went back to college. Shortly after that, I moved up here to northern Wisconsin where my, um, my wife was going to school. Mm -hmm. So I kind of chased her up here and just started working in the area and then ended up going back to college when I was 21 and um, ended up in the, mostly in the art department, making pots and drawing pictures, doing printmaking, stuff like that. Okay. So the pipe making came first, but um, I've probably thrown a lot more pots than I've made pipes overall. I mean, <laughs> you can whip out pots pretty quick after you get a good feel for it. Yeah. And there's a lot and, 
Sorry, go on. Well, I was going to say in my, when I went to school, I got a art degree, studio art degree. Yeah. And my like senior show that you have to do, you know, where you have like a whole art show, that's just all your stuff from the whole thing. I actually, it was called, it was pipes and pottery. So I had my pipes in there too, even though I didn't make them at school, but pipes were actually a big part of my my senior art show as well, which was kind of fun. Something different, you know, people hadn't seen that. It's gone back a long way then. And just a quick question then, whenever um, your uh, missus, your girlfriend at the time, your now wife, when she bought you the pipe kit, was that when you knew she was a keeper? Uh, it certainly helped. Yeah, <laughs> it, definitely, cool. it definitely helped. Yeah, no, that's cool. I, I run into so many people who enjoy this hobby, whose significant other and really does, doesn't does like the smell or the, 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 whole, the whole thing. I lost you briefly there, but- You, I, you I, cut I, out there for a minute. Yeah, what, what, what was your question? Um, no, I was just reflecting on um, how I know some people in the piping community whose significant other uh, despises the smell and doesn't like them smoking or whatever. We're quite lucky. Like my father-in-law is a big cigar smoker. So Steph was, it's nostalgic almost for her, the, the smell. I like to think anyway. Um, so have you any uh, favorite pipes? Yeah, my my wife doesn't really mind it. Okay, good. Favorite pipes? Oh yeah. man, I got lots of favorite pipes. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what my favorite pipe is. I mean, there's the old answer, it's whatever pipe I'm smoking at the time, I guess. But I mean, I yeah, I got a lot of favorite pipes. Uh, hmm. <laughs> I don't, I'm not quite sure what my all-time favorite is. One of my favorite pipes, even though I don't smoke it very much, is is this old, um, it's just a made in Italy, no-name pipe, but this was one of my grandpa's pipes. Oh, cool, cool. And uh, I don't... Rustication's lovely. Yeah, it's kind of neat. It's, you know, it would have been a cheaper pipe. He didn't spend a lot of money on that sort of thing, but um, this is one of the first pipes that I kind of learned pipe smoking on yeah so that's if the house was burning down i even though i could buy another one of these for probably 15 dollars on ebay i'd probably it would definitely be in a handful of pipes i would try to grab yeah what is the material in the the ferru on this one yeah yeah it looks interesting i think it's just uh brass with a piece of acrylic inlaid in it Right, it's um, kind of a nice color. Yeah, it's not bad. I mean, I wouldn't say this is even my favorite looking pipe or anything, but as far as, you know, sentiment goes, it's one of my favorites. I also have a, a kind of a bigger uh, Sheraton second pipe made in London. That was his. That's also one of my, uh, you know, more, more favorite pipes just because it was my grandpa's pipe. Cool. It's good that you have that, that history then, and you come from a, a line of pipe smokers. Was your father a pipe smoker as well? Or? Um, no, my, my dad still smokes cigarettes, although not as much as he used to, but he does have a collection of pipes. Um, as me and him, we're always into going to auctions and estate sales and stuff like that. And so we've always kind of collected things and kind of buying and selling stuff and he knew I was into pipes, so I got him to start looking out for pipes. And now he actually has quite a big collection, even though he never smokes them, but he won't give them to me yet. <laughs> <laughs> Just being awkward. Yeah, it's pretty funny. That's cool. Though. But yeah, there's been a number of pipe smokers in my family on both sides generationally. Mm -hmm. But my my grandpa on my mom's side was the one who owned that pipe. And I lived with uh, my grandparents for a number of years when I was a teenager. And so um, that one has a lot of meaning. He was mostly, uh, he chewed like Copenhagen and Skoll. That was his main kind of tobacco 
consumption, but he also smoked cheap cigars and he'd pull his, the pipe out occasionally and, you know, right. smoke some cherry tobacco or something, something like that. Yeah. And did you ever have any experience with any dip or snuff or snooze or? Um, I mean, I've, I've chewed and I've tried those, um, like the little skull bandits in the packet thing. Yeah. You know? And I never really got into that stuff. Um, I tried it and I always liked the flavor of it, but mm -hmm. it's just so messy. I just can't deal with it. And you're spitting all the time. And yeah, that wasn't for me. I've always preferred smoke, you know, smoking yeah. a pipe. I've been smoking a pipe since I was 17. But before that, when I was quite a bit younger, I, I smoked cigarettes too. It was uh, a probably a more tobacco friendly atmosphere than it should have been growing up. And uh, one day I just quit cold turkey smoking cigarettes and didn't smoke anything for a year. And then when I was 17, uh, my, my grandpa passed away and I got some of his pipes and started smoking a pipe. Excellent. So you must have been very early with what did you start smoking cigarettes when you were 13 or 12 or something or earlier? Uh, like nine. Right. You naughty, naughty yeah. boy. <laughs> very lucky. <laughs> yeah. I, oh man, I used to get into a lot of trouble, but I guess, I guess they kind of figured it was better than doing a lot of other things. Of course, I was doing a lot of other things back then too, Great. but um, I'm, I'm glad I quit when I did because I don't know, one day I was, so at, a, at school we had a, what you call a smoking corner. And I don't even know if this is a thing at schools anymore, but you know, there's a corner, it was like a block and a half in front of the school. And that's where all of us uh, juvenile delinquents, you know, would hang out before and after school and at lunch hour. And so we'd be out there smoking cigarettes and talking smart and whatnot. And uh, so, oh man, yeah, we used to, we used to get into a lot of trouble, but, mm -hmm. but one day I was out there and I just was like, for some, for some reason out of the blue, I don't know why I was just like, man, this smoking cigarettes is just kind of a crutch. You know, it just felt like too much of a, I, I didn't feel like I was necessarily enjoying it, yeah. you know? And I remember I pulled out my pack of cigarettes and kind of half-heartedly threw them on the ground, mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, ah, I don't, I'm not gonna, I'm done with this. And even then it was kind of a, a half-assed attempt at quitting, but what really made me quit then was uh, all the other, all my friends like scrambled for those cigarettes on the ground, you know, yeah. and I was like, ah. And then after that, I, I just, I quit smoking cigarettes. I kind of didn't hang out with as many of those friends for a while, just cause I was trying to quit smoking and, um, but I missed it. I missed, uh, you know, I probably missed the nicotine and I also missed having something in my hand, you know, the physical kind of, kind of thing. So then, like I said, later on, I ended up inheriting some pipes and, uh, picking up the pipe and I've enjoyed it ever since. I, I've never felt that it's been that same kind of addiction yeah. necessarily, or, you know, the, that same crutch. Mm -hmm. um, it ju I just enjoyed it a lot more. It was a lot more relaxing, you know, to yeah. sit down and chill out and, you know, so yeah, yeah I'm glad that I found the, found the pipe relatively early before I had, you know, 25 years of smoking cigarettes under my belt. No, that, uh, that is good. I think I had my first cigarette when I was about that age, well, 11 or so, but I didn't start smoking regularly until I was 16. But yeah. I, I remember my first few cigarettes and um, John Player special. I think they had John Players all over the world. So you maybe have players in America. Yeah, I, I've heard of them. Those are, yeah, they were higher, a little bit higher end cigarettes, um, players Navy cut or something like that. Well, these were um, pretty strong. Like I remember being like literally physically sick the first few times. Oh but yeah. You keep doing it because it's cool, you know, you have to. Keep yeah. <laughs> I remember the, the 
the well, I don't want to get into too much on cigarette smoking just because this is all out there. But um, I yeah, I remember smoking a cigarette for the for the first time, like having a whole cigarette, not just sneaking a puff for my you know family members' cigarettes. But I was at a park, yeah, uh, hanging out with the older crowd. You know, I was I was a young guy hanging out with these older guys, and um, they're like, oh, let's give Weaver a cigarette. You know, here you go, and man i just remember my head just swimming you know <laughs> horrible oh, feeling. horrible feeling for a few hours mm -hmm. it, it goes away as fast as it came doesn't it okay so let's see i'm gonna ask you then about your favorite blends if you could narrow it down to three if somebody said to you I'm sorry, Eric, for the rest of your days, you're only allowed three blends. What would you choose? Oh man. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, I know I know the stuff that I smoke on a regular basis, but if, if I'm trying to think of, you know, if I could pick any tobacco that's been made, that's, geez, that's tough. Well, we won't do that. We won't pick anything that you can't get anymore. Well, you can um, do that. That's fine. You can do that. Just nice to know what, what you really couldn't live well, with. Well, I really, I really like some of the, um, I really liked the McClellan's Frog Morton series mm -hmm. a lot. Um, and I also really liked their English Bulk and Blue or Blue Mountain and Three Oaks. Those are good for your heavier English. Is the bulk um, blend gone now as well? The bulk yeah, I mean, the McClellans, you know, is they don't make any of them. Oh, it's all, it? yeah, the, uh, they're not making any of that anymore. Mm. But um, otherwise, I think if I had to pick a tobacco right now, it'd probably be something like this blend number 39 or maybe GLP's Maltese Falcon, kind of a uh, medium English blend, okay. even though I enjoy all sorts of tobaccos, that's those are probably kind of my go to style of blend at the moment. It's, it's right in the middle. It's not like super, super dark for in the evening with a really rich Latakia, but it has enough Latakia and oomph and other things that it's pretty well balanced. So that would be number three, then would it? I don't know. It's hard. It's hard picking <laughs> picking something like that, you know, because I'm not a. I mean, I have my favorite brands, but I don't just smoke. You know, I'm. I don't have like that brand loyalty where you know, like cigarette smokers usually have their their yeah. brand and they just stick to that. Where one of the great things about pipe smoking is we have all these different varieties to try. You yeah. know, and that's part that's a big part of the fun for me is just trying all these different pipes and all these all these tobaccos and yeah you know having that variety i think i i like that more than one specific brand you know i, I like being able to have a variety of stuff depending on my mood and taste at that at that moment yeah it's a curse having so much variety i think sometimes though there's so much and I hate that uh, fear of missing out. Uh, and mm -hmm. you're always chasing the next perfect. For me, it's that perfect burly that has the, <laughs> the nut more nutty than rather than the harsh kind of more ready tones you can sometimes get. Yeah. So I'm on that never ending quest for the perfect <laughs> burly. Mm -hmm. I'm, I don't I don't really feel like I, I don't. I don't. Uh, worry too much about missing out necessarily or or you know finding the perfect blend I, i'm always trying new stuff just in case there is something that i really like but I, I guess i don't feel the need to chase a whole lot of stuff like real hard yeah um i try to enjoy what i have while i have it and then if something else comes along i'll try to enjoy that too i guess yeah good um, are you cellaring anything in particular, or had you cellared any McClellan blends, for example? Or well, yeah, I mean, I have a, a cellar. It's it. Uh, I don't know if it's super focused, but I have a variety of stuff. Um, 
I did have a lot of McClellan's blends. Actually, um, I stocked up. I had a lot of Frog Morton blends. I had quite a few of their Virginias. I had I had a lot of their a lot of their tins, but then they they closed down, you know. And what happened was the value of that tobacco all of a sudden skyrocketed, mm -hmm. and I needed some work done on my truck. And so I needed some money. So I kind of had to sit down and decide, well, I'm not going to be able to really buy this tobacco in the future, you know, so do I want to keep it around or should I just sell it now while the prices are higher and then I can pay for the repairs on my truck, you know? Yeah. So I pretty much sold all my, my McClellan's tobacco yeah. and got rid of almost all of it. And then um, I did, I was able to get some tins this last year, um, um, maybe eight or nine tins in a deal with pipes and bees from, from Canada. So I do have a little bit of McClellan's, but not what I, not what I used to. And um, I don't regret selling it. Um, basically, I just couldn't afford to keep it anymore because it became worth too much money and I needed, I needed money more than tobacco at the time. Makes but, sense. At least you did the wise thing. Yeah. Yeah. But as far as what I'm selling now, I mean, I have a variety of stuff, but I do have quite a bit of that Sutliff uh, Virginia slices because you can buy it in bulk pretty cheap, like $34, $35 a pound. And for the price, I think it's a really good quality. And I really like those Virginias in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. So i I've been seller in that. I think I have not a lot, but maybe three pounds of that. And I, I even this back here, this cabinet, this is all a bunch of stuff. I have a number of rat trays, blends. I have uh, quite a bit of um, old Dunhill, older Dun, not super old, but you know, Dunhill brand tins that I'm just letting age. Um, yeah, I, I can have, see the early morning pipe there. I can see. Yep. Yep. I have some esoterica because I do enjoy that from time to time. Penzance? Um, yeah, I have some Penzance. That's pretty good. It's a, that's a deeper, a deeper, darker English uh, blend, but creamier Latakia, not, right. not rough. Is it Syrian? Or that's one thing. Um, I don't think there's any Syrian in that, in the stuff I have, excuse me, but it, it's aged, it's got some age on it and it, that Latakia kind of smooths out as it ages. It doesn't, it's not as, as uh, in your face, kind of, yeah, the, the rough edges disappear a little bit. Um, so I do like that blend, but it's certainly not an everyday smoke for me. What else do I got? Some, you know, I got like some Maltese Falcon because I like that quite a bit. And um, I don't know how much tobacco I have. A decent amount, but not nearly as much as some people have. You know, some people, I think they have like a whole room of it or something. Yeah. yeah. There are some guys that uh, are prepped for the end of the world for tobacco wise. Um, What's well, it's not the dumbest thing to do if you can afford it. Like yeah. I said, the, when that, when McClellan's closed down, if I wouldn't have had that, that tobacco on hand, I mean, I would have uh, not, you know, wouldn't have had the money to, to fix up my, my vehicle at the time. So that's one thing we don't talk about a whole lot in the YTPC, but any, any form of collecting um, is an investment. And you know, things go up and down in value. And if you buy something cheap now in another five years, you don't know what's going to happen. And you might be able to leverage that small investment into a bigger one and maybe turn a couple of tins into like one really expensive pipe or multiple nice pipes. Or, you know, if you want to reinvest it in the hobby, or if you have to, you can sell stuff and do and pay for an expense in your, in your regular life. You know, so pipes and tobacco have been pretty good to me, actually, in that in that regard. Um, 
after a while, like if you have enough stuff built up, you can buy, trade and sell things where it just keeps almost paying for itself a little bit. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. That's wise then. Um, let's take a look. Tobacco prices in Canada at the minute. I assume you're... you're well, I'm in America. Oh, that's right. You're Wisconsin, aren't you? Yeah. Sorry. I got to I got to cross the lake to get to Canada, but that's it. I'm being <laughs> silly. Sorry. So yes, you're benefiting from the full price of lovely American prices. Then, um, do you smoke when you're out and about uh, in the general public? I used to a lot more. I mean, I'm not out and about at all anymore with COVID going on. True. So, but I mean, usually I smoke it down here in the basement in my shop because it's the most comfortable and it's where I am most of the time. But if I happen to be walking the dog or something, I might be smoking a pipe. Or if I'm driving somewhere, a lot of times I'll, if I'm by myself, I'll smoke a pipe in my truck or whatever. Mm -hmm. When I was younger, I used to be out and about a lot with a pipe, like back in my college days and stuff like that. You know, you'd, you'd pretty much see me walking around campus and around town with a pipe almost all the time. Good. And back before the smoking ban hit the bars here in Wisconsin in 2007, I used to have a couple of couple of taverns I used to like to go into and, uh, you know, order myself a, a nice pitcher of beer just for myself and sit there and have a good old drink and, uh, you know, smoke a pipe all night. And that, those are good days, I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah, I miss being able to smoke indoors. I don't even think there's tobacconists uh, that, I mean, there are still um, tobacco shops, very decent ones in, in most of Ireland, uh, or the North anyway. I think the South has lost a lot, um, but you're not allowed to smoke in them anymore. Um, I think there are some hotels that can say they have a smoking room, uh, not bedrooms, but just like a, a lobby, a smoking yep. cigar room or whatever. So maybe, hopefully that sticks around for another, like how long do we have left? I just really wish they would make the distinctions, um, you know, cigarettes versus tobacco and, or sorry, uh, cigars and pipes. Yeah. It's really tiresome that, uh, that they don't make that distinction. It is, it is very much so. They just lump everything together, you know, instead of getting a little more educated on it. Um, the only thing kind of saving pipe tobacco is actually probably cigars because there's enough, you know, big wheel and, uh, politicians and businessmen that smoke, you know, they, some of them smoke pipes too, but there's enough cigar guys that, uh, have some sway when the powers that be that seem to be able to push back on some of those regulations a little bit. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a shame that people just can't manage their own, um, vices, if you want to call it that, or, you know, and keep things in moderation, you know? Yeah. So are you, are you a member or talking about politicians, uh, and cigars, was it, uh, uh, JFK? Kennedy, how many cigars did he order just before he banned the Cuban? Uh, it was, I think it was. I, I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know that stuff. It was probably think, a lot. I think it was twenty thousand or something, or maybe it was either two thousand or twenty thousand. Hopefully twenty. Hopefully. But yeah, well, I'll tell you a story. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a quick story. So I used to work at this store. It was a book, book shop slash tobacco shop. Mm -hmm. I worked there when I was in college. And um, while I worked there, um, we got notified well in advance that roll your own cigarette tobacco, you know, yeah. was going to be going up. The tax bracket was going to be changing over at this specific date. So we knew it like, I don't know, a month or maybe two months ahead of time. And I was telling all my customers that bought it, I said, you, if you want to keep using this stuff, you really need to buy it now because on this date, it's actually going to double in price. 
yeah. like it literally doubled in price from one day to the other. And, you know, like none of them, Nobody listened. none of them did what I said. And I didn't have any money at the time. I was basically making minimum wage, you know. Uh, but if I would have had a lot of money at the time, I would have bought out all that, the higher end, roll your own tobacco and probably just, you know, <laughs> went black market with it or something and hope not to get caught because, you know, I could have just bumped it up 25% or oh, yeah. 50%. Yeah. Because it, it, it got really expensive quick. It's just mad how they're coming down. Menthol cigarettes have just come off the market now for us. Uh, hmm. So, I mean, where do they get these ideas from? As if menthol cigarettes are attractive to children or, or teenagers. But I mean, yeah, I don't know. It it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. That's for sure. Um, you know what can you say? I, <laughs> it's I I like that. I don't know if I like it, but I, I wish that the cigarettes didn't have to be regulated so much, mostly because it has such an impact on other forms of tobacco. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, it, I think it is good that cigarette smoking is, um, what's the word? I don't want to say look down upon, but it's not as glamorized as it used to be. Yeah. You know, even when I was a kid in the 80s and 90s. Um, but it's just, you know, there's always the, all this side side effects. When you regulate one thing, it affects all these other other things that really aren't an issue. Yeah. So it's amazing. If people could only handle themselves, you know. Indeed. Yeah. But it, it has worked. The children these days, any you know, kids that I talk to in and around the, the age, you know, 14 to 18, it's not cool. It's mm -hmm. not cool. You don't smoke cigarettes. You're a loser if you do. Yeah, it's a lot different than when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. When I was a kid, I mean, I'd smoke anything I could get my hands on. <laughs> you had to smoke you know? to be cool. It was a part of being cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there definitely was that for sure. Yeah, it's weird how times change. Yeah. Are, are you a member of any pipe clubs or are there any pipe clubs in your the Wisconsin area? Um, there's nothing by me. There's not even uh, any pipe shops. That shop that I worked at closed down a number of years ago. And so I have to order all my tobacco online now. If, if I want to find a brick and mortar, I got to go to like down by uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, probably that area. Cause there's, I, I don't even, I don't even think far. there's anything over in Duluth, Minnesota. Right. That's quite far then. How yeah. far is that from you? You're near the yeah. border. That's, it's about three and a half hours. <laughs> yeah. Three and a half hour drive. It's not, yeah. not, there is, there is a pipe club down there that I actually would like to um, attend a meeting sometime because my wife's family lives down there but um i haven't been able to able to do that yet okay i've thought about starting one up several times through the years but um there's not you don't see a lot of pipe smokers around and when i worked at that store i was able to to meet a lot of them but a lot of, a number of those guys passed away or moved away and but i think after covid i mean i do have a handful of friends in the area that are uh, younger that have picked up pipe smoking more in the last couple of years. And so I might try to form some sort of, um, you know, more casual kind of pipe club where we all get together and whatever, once a month or something, hopefully. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'd like to start one. I can't find one at the moment. Uh, yeah. I think whenever um, the smoking ban came in, a lot of them just simply cease to be, and a lot of it's quite depressing. You think of, uh, you know, 
some of the bars in town are still old fashioned and w whenever you could smoke there used to be several old you know old guys you know pensioners with their pipes and you think of what they're doing now yeah. if, if they're still alive you know they're just sitting in the house with their carry out you know their their alcohol from the off license depressed on their own you know because they you yeah. know can't smoke and they're not going to stand outside smoking like screw that yeah but it's just upsetting it upsets me that you know you can't have a, a hall a different side of the bar you know but hey um yeah yeah i think i think it, that should be up to the um the owner of the establishment myself yeah. Yeah. you know when it comes to tobacco issues i'm definitely not for a lot of a lot of regulation yeah. other other issues i'm a little more for some regulation but i i think that should be up to the business owner they should be able to decide what kind of uh establishment they want to have you know and if you don't like it don't go in yep yeah absolutely um let's see so i saw your most recent video the frustrations that uh that was a lot of work went into that little stem <laughs> yeah i got it right here yeah that little, uh, i can't really see the hole without a flashlight but there's a little you can see it there hole. yeah yeah, yeah right under it that happens you know I've, I've actually been lucky and i've only done that one other time and um that, that's a that's a pretty frequent thing when you're first learning you know to try to be able to find to make it thin enough but thick enough that you don't go into the air hole and you know that's that's just what happens i'm just glad it wasn't a bigger a bigger piece with more money and, and time invested yeah um yeah, but I was working today and I did get another um, piece of rod stock fitted to it. So hopefully this one works out. It's a little bit longer. It's also, a, I don't know if you can see, it's kind of a purplish, it's a, a kind of a fancy Cumberland ebonite. Nice. Um, I don't know what they call it, winter edition or something that's kind of got blues and purples and We'll see. I think it might be pretty cool. It's not Eldritch, is it? Or do, who do you go through for those materials? Or? Uh, this is all German um, made ebonite um, nice. from, there's a couple companies, uh, SEM ebonite and NYH ebonite. Those, you know, are initials for some German words I can't say. Okay. And th those are kind of like considered the best um, material really. Um, I, I'd like to try that Eldridge stock sometime. Um, one of the pipe making supply companies in the States here, Raw Crafted, he just got a shipment of that. So he's going to be distributing it in the States. Okay. So I might pick up a little bit of that. Otherwise, I know I can buy some directly from that Chris Kelly too. But yeah. I like the look of it, but it's a little, it's a little on the bright side for me. For what I want in my own work, um, but I could really see using it as, you know, a, a band or an accent or something. You could maybe request the uh, apparently whatever way the rods set. There's more of the color in one end than the other, so you could okay. maybe you could maybe request the darker end of the rod. Yeah. 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 I, I mostly get a lot of my. Uh, materials from uh, either Vermont freehand or raw crafted. They've in the last 10 years, man, I'll tell you what, all of a sudden, if you want to get into pipe making, the ability to buy tools and, and uh, supplies has just really opened up with those two companies. Before that, you kind of had to know somebody or you were only able to buy the, the stuff, the dedicated, you know, the higher end pipe makers didn't buy and so yeah it's good you got more choices now it's a little more competitive you can people are importing a lot more materials and uh it's pretty cool i actually just made a deal with a, a pipe maker who was getting out of the business um this year i 
first I made a deal with him and bought him all, all his remaining briar. Okay. Um, I made a video on that a couple months ago. Yes. But I just act, I just closed another deal with him where I bought all all his remaining um, stem making rods and stock and a couple of little tools and stuff. So okay. I'm going to be getting even more. So I'm I'm pretty supplied up right now, or about to be quite supplied up. I probably really don't have to buy anything for years if I don't want to. That's good news. Um, yeah. Was the briar already sitting around, already reached a healthy age? Yeah, and it's good stuff. Um, he's had it for at least a few years, and some of it was probably aged a couple years before he even bought it. Right, really. And um, a lot of a lot of what I got from him is is uh, material that. I had been buying myself as well, so I was already familiar with its quality. Mm -hmm. yep. So that worked out really good. It's been a really big year for me this year. I mean, not necessarily in terms of like becoming super successful, but as far as um, investing a lot more money into the, the business and getting more materials and just trying to get my name out there more. That's um, good. Yeah. Um. The three recent ones you made, I think I see on Instagram, they've, they've gone, haven't they? I, I really like the, uh, it was a uh, like a squat Rhodesian or squat uh, bulldog with a crumbled edge on, of the bull. I think it's gone. Um, yeah, the last three pipes I made, I sold that Rhodesian right away. Because mm -hmm. um, a guy, <clears throat> one of our YTPC, uh, buddies had contacted me a while ago saying that he was you know looking to get some sort of Rhodesian so when I got around to making one I I uh, kind of gave him first dibs on that and he scooped it up right away and then the other two I still have around I've had some people interested in it but it hasn't they haven't sold quite yet the um what do I got let me see. look in my boxes of pipes so if you go on my website, you know, there's a page that says available pipes and it has pretty much anything that's available right now. And that is seasmokepipesandpottery.com, is it? Yep. yep. Or you can look for me on Instagram or whatever, or of course, YouTube. I'll leave a link uh, in the bucket to uh, all, all of them. So Sure. But, you know, this one is one of my newer ones. It's, uh, kind of a freehand Dublin. That with, is really nice green. With partial, a little bit of partial plateau on the outer edge and then the inside rim, I like to smooth out closer to the bowl. So it's easier to clean and also a little easier to load. Um, but this one turned out pretty nice. It had, I don't know if you can see that, yeah, good flame grain, isn't it? Yeah, and there's two little spots. I don't think it's showing up, but it has two little copper accents, little dots oh, on the good. shank. And so what happened here was there was a flaw, mm. like a little tiny mini twig that the burl grew around. And so it was vertical in the shank, but like just on the very outside of the shank, there you can kind of yeah, see yeah, part yeah, of it. it now, yeah. And it was kind of a tube that went up through the shank up to here. Right. And so I was pretty much done shaping the pipe and I started seeing these flaws and I didn't want to alter the shape of the pipe. You know, I could have just carved them away really easily or even rusticated it, but the grain on this pipe was so nice. I didn't want to, I just didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So what I did is uh, I actually took a little drill bit and drilled right through the flaw and kind of excavated the, you know, the debris out of there. Mm -hmm. And then I took a little piece of copper wire and glued it in place and nipped off the, the ends and just formed it right to the shank. So, so now it has these little copper That's accents really, where the That's flaw really cool. was. That could be your new calling card. Well, I, I, I think it's a nice way to deal with certain flaws if you can. 
Um, it, it reminds me of the, it's either Japanese or Chinese, um, where they would replace porcelain with gold, where it break, where it breaks, they'll glue it with, or solder it with gold. Or it looks beautiful. Yeah, that's, they call that kintsugi. Kintsugi, right. Yeah, and that's with, <clears throat> they use Yerushi lacquer and um, gold powder. That's, uh, I mean, I know about it because it's uh, pottery related and okay. um, I really enjoy Japanese pottery quite a bit. And um, yeah, that's a, that's a whole art in itself, the yeah. art of repairing. Yeah. It's, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. So anyway, that was one of my most recent pipes. And then I got this one too, um, that I'm calling the whale egg. And this pipe turned out really nice. Has some pretty good grain on that side. Well, there, it all has good grain, but on this side in particular, it has some really nice grain. Lovely. So That's that was a pretty cool pipe to make. It is. It this is a shape that just reminds me of a sperm whale. Yeah. Yeah. So this this is an example of a pipe that kind of just made itself. Mm -hmm. Um. Not to say I didn't have a general idea of what I wanted to do. I had a, a general idea of kind of the silhouette of the pipe um, based on the block I had. But as I started working on it, it just kind of sprang to life on its own, so to speak. And <clears throat> anyway, it, so if you're familiar with the whale shape, it's usually longer and it can really take on some crazy different variations for people that have done it. And I, I've never made one before. And this was is a lot more compact, yeah. but it kind of reminded me of that shape. And so I kind of incorporated a little bit of a line there, a kind of a soft line, but it also looks a little bit like an egg shape. So that's why I'm calling it the whale egg. The whale egg. And yeah. I'm, I'm pretty happy with this with this uh, shape. I hopefully I can um, replicate something similar. But yeah, that was, that's a pretty cool one. So, the pipes, do you make any nine mil filter pipes, or are they all non filter? I do. I do make nine mil pipes uh, once in a while. I haven't made a lot of them. I just kind of started making them on and off this year, mm -hmm. and um, mostly because you know. There's a lot of people in the YouTube pipe community that enjoy them and were asking me about them. Mm -hmm. So I, I do make them, but it's not not as often as your standard tenon. It's just kind of maybe once every 10 or 15 pipes, I'll, I'll make one. And for now, for the nine milliliter pipes I make, I've been using um, some pre like pre-molded stems that already have the nine millimeter ten and all taken care of yeah just because i'm still trying to figure out that nine millimeter thing and uh the stems that i can get for those are really high quality and i can just modify them to my own my own liking okay so but yeah i, I do make some nine mils but not a lot Ooh. i don't know if i'll make a lot more in the future i I don't smoke filter pipes, so it's not something I naturally think about. Yeah. But um, it's nice to offer one every once in a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you ever get commission? Do people ask you for commission? Yeah, people ask me, and I'm kind of... <clears throat> um, I've done some commissions, and... It's fine, but I actually, I don't really like working that way. I kind of like to just explore my own creative, uh, you know, tangents and see what develops. And then if someone likes the pipe, then they can buy it. That's kind of my preferred way to do it. But, you know, like that Rhodesian I just made, I got, you know, a guy did contact me and say he was hoping to get a Rhodesian sometime from me, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so that was not quite a commission because I, I basically said, well, I am planning on maybe making one soon. Mm -hmm. So I'll write your name down and you'll be the first person I contact. Yeah. So I do loose commissions like that. 
I guess, where if you see something that I've made in the past that you like and you think you might want something similar, yeah. I'm not going to guarantee it's going to be exactly the same, but similar. I'll, you know, keep your information and contact you first, mm -hmm. kind of. I, I don't really want to be contacted by somebody who has an idea of a pipe with all these specific measurements and whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, and some of my pipe makers do that all the time. They're great at it. I just, it, for me, I always feel like when you're doing work like that, there's all this, this expectation of what it's going to be. And I kind of feel like no matter how good you make it, um, you know, there might be a little bit of a letdown depending. I mean, not necessarily, but it's just, I don't know. I don't really like working that way. Um, I am open to any ideas people have for sure, but it, it's, it's a much looser kind of thing for me, I guess, for my style of, of making pipes. Um, what's your, uh, your favorite shape to make then? Or do you have one or would you just like them all? Like you say, it just depends on the, the block of, uh, briar and whatever way it looks as if it's going to turn out. Um, this year I've really enjoyed making a lot of um, tomato shapes and volcanoes. Those right now are probably my two favorite shapes to make that and I have been making a number of Rhodesians this year. So I think those are kind of my three current shapes that I enjoy making the most. Um, but I mean I like making billiards now and then and apples and um, I enjoy making Dublins with a plateau top. I always think that that's a great looking, looking pipe. So I, I mean, I like all shapes, but definitely the tomato and the volcano this year. I've really, I just always really love the look of those pipes. You can really show off the bird's eye with them a lot. Yeah. yeah. Some lovely pipes too, but um the uh dublin you just showed me it's very nice very nice grain on it i really yeah, like please. that idea with the copper as well i really like mm -hmm. that idea take it it wasn't premeditated you just kind of did it that's what i like about it too i think yeah the cut co that copper accent for sure i didn't plan that out initially because obviously i didn't see the flaw till the pipe was just about completely shaped and then I just wasn't, I just didn't want to alter it, you know, on some pipes, if I see something like that, I'll basically just change the design a little bit and get rid of the flaw, or maybe I would rusticate over it, yeah. which I really don't even rusticate all that much. But for that pipe that worked out well, but I, I was just really happy with the shape of the shank and I didn't want to make a a divot in it and have to do something it would have made the grain look different and so yeah yeah i was i'm pretty happy with the way that it turned out that was and you know that that's the kind of thing that no matter what you're no matter what you're doing whether it's a craft or even business or anything i mean those are the learning moments you know when you when you come up against a problem like that you got to think of a way to to solve the problem and it's always nice if you can if you can come up with multiple ways to do it and kind of pick the one that works the best and you know sometimes you might be doing a shape like that and you decide to alter the shape mm -hmm. to get rid of the flaw or whatever yeah and you might stumble onto a variation of that shape that you really like and then in the future you'll try to replicate what you initially had to make because it was a messed up pipe you know, and those are the, the kind of shapes and moments I really like that makes it more exciting to me. You know, the, that interaction with the material pottery is a lot is very similar too, because sometimes you'll be making a pot on the wheel and something might start leaning or something will happen. And then you decide to do something else. And all of a sudden you're like, you know, yeah, it's kind of a happy accident, but from that from that moment, you can build on it into something 
that becomes a signature style for you or you know something that you never would have thought of ahead of time yeah it adds to the it speaks to the organic nature of the of the art itself i guess mm -hmm. that's great well listen we'll wrap it up but finally i just wanted to ask um with uh, more and more people uh, talking about perhaps the demise of the YouTube piping community. Have you thought about cross posting on uh, Rumble, for example? Nope. Um, not not at this point. I guess if that ever happens, I'll look into it. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know. People have been yelling that the sky has fallen for eternity on, <laughs> you know, in all sorts of different aspects of life. And so, I mean, I'm not worried about it. I don't know if it happens, it happens. And that would really suck, but I'm not, I'm not uh, jumping ship or anything. And, you know, if that happens, I'll, maybe I'll start another channel somewhere else, or maybe I just won't even do the video stuff anymore. Or maybe I'll post videos to my website somehow or you know, find a different way to to interact but um well hopefully it, doesn't. it sure would be a shame though because uh you the youtube pipe thing is yeah i mean i've only been doing the youtube thing for two years and man it is it's awesome yeah it's really been great fun yeah absolutely absolutely me too finding it a blast so far well listen we'll we'll wrap up the recording i'll stop the recording here so thank you very much uh, for joining me and uh, hope the viewers enjoy this. And like I said, yeah. all, all the links to your uh, seismic pottery and pottery.com and your uh, Instagram and everything in the bucket. So folks, if you're interested, have a look. There's some very, very nice use of plateau and some beautiful pipes there. So thank you, Eric. Well, thank you for having me, Kaz. It was great fun. <laughs>